And it's the people behind driving the ideas, driving them forward. So the decisive battlefield essentially becomes the better that you can attract, assess, select, hire, retain, train, and grow your people. Ultimately, it amounts to the fact that you have the best people on your team. And the team with the best people wins and wins constantly. Providing you don't get that, you know, the complacency you use. Welcome to the Waste No Day podcast, a podcast specifically for and about the home services industry as it relates to plumbing, heating, air conditioning, and electrical. More than a podcast, Waste No Day is a credo, a determination, a mindset. It is a never ending discipline, it is a refuse to lose pursuit. It is a wake-up call every morning to waste no day. Now here's your hosts, Brian Burton and Nate Minnick. Hey, welcome to another episode of the Waste No Day podcast. Your hosts, Nate and Brian, are hanging out with you on this new week. And we are excited to have another guest bring into the show his content. This time we're talking on... The Talent War with co-author George Randall. We're excited to have him on talking about not only his book, but the concepts there within. As uh, we all here in the trades know that there is a desperate need for great talent. We're excited to have him on. But first, we're going to break down the concepts on an introduction before we invite George on. And first, we're going to look to Brian for our quote. The best people will not tolerate poor leadership. They will do their best to influence and change it. But if they cannot, they will leave. Jocko Willink from the Talent War. All right, all right. Uh, yeah, that's that's kind of one of those um, well-known but uh, little applied principles. You better be on guard walking around thinking about that in your business. Absolutely. In I don't in your business on your team in your family. The I mean, we have you know t- team leaders, field supervisors, service managers listening. Your teammates are looking for a team leader, hundred percent. If you're not, if you're not able to be that, or or not able to be a good version of that, if you're not reading about that and studying that and trying to make yourself better at it, just get out of the way and let somebody else do it. Do your team a favor, because your team will will roll out on you. They're looking for good leadership. Yeah, and and you're right about that, Brian. And unfortunately, you'll you'll often see it. Um, and the things that are unseen, like somebody will, they'll kind of fade away, right? It's just like the customer experience. When do you know you're losing clients? Well, the, the trick of it is you probably don't because most clients will just quietly go away. There's a few clients that will call you up and they'll tell you that they're upset. There's a few clients that will call you up and tell you that if you do this, it will be better. Or if you fix this, I'll come back. But the majority of clients that have a negative experience will just fade away. They'll just go somewhere else and they'll never tell you. They'll never call you. They'll never let you know these are the reasons why or this is why I left. It's the exact same when it comes to your employees, when it comes to the people on your team. You'll just start seeing people slowly start fading away. They disengage from the company. They stop coming to the meetings. They stop paying attention. Uh, they're less, you know, less involved with uh, the general culture or everything that's going on and they just fade away and all of a sudden they turn in their two weeks and you didn't see it coming. And then, and then it's too late, right? Because then you start asking questions, well, where are you going? Or like, you know, what, what's wrong or what's happening? And uh, by then the answers are, no, you know, it's, it's, it's nothing. It's fine here. I just got a better offer. Or like I really like to pursue this or something. And you don't realize that that wasn't a in the moment decision. That was something that had happened long ago and you're now only seeing the fruit of it. The first question to ask when somebody that you don't want to leave leaves is, and, and there's always an answer. Why were they looking? Why were they searching for something? If you have somebody who is so content in their position and with the team they're on, that you really don't have to worry about them wanting to leave. If someone approaches them with an op- opportunity, I wouldn't say it's met with deaf ears, but it's it's not. I mean, I, I've been approached so many times in the position I'm in right now with o- other opportunities. 
as I'm sure Nate has, as I know Nate has. And it's, it's an afterthought. You don't ask how much. I don't know about you. I don't think there's been a single time where I entertained it even enough to say, how much are we talking about? Like, I'm engaged here. I'm, I'm into this. I'm building things. Like, you can't take me out with a little, little bit more money or whatever it is. It's so Brian's getting stuck in the dream world. He, he, he put his totem in the safe and he's, he's now building things from scratch. He can't go back to reality. <laughs> That's gonna be, that's gonna be a tough sell for our uh, people who are not Inception fans, buddy. <laughs> that will not make a lot of sense to anybody who's not seen it. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll we'll circle back to a little bit of uh, Christopher Nolan movies, I'm sure. As I, I have oh, yeah. a question for our guest about uh, one quote from the book that I heard uh, Bane say in The Dark Knight Rises to Batman. He said something to the tune of "Peace has made you soft." Victory has defeated you, right? There it is. Yeah, um, yeah, and we'll we'll get back to that with Mister Randall. But if if uh, peace has cost your strength, oh, peace has cost your strength. Okay, victory has defeated you. That that was the main thing. Though. Yeah, it just I, it sounded better with the other sentence connected to it. I like it. it. Yeah. I like it. Victory has defeated you. There's a there's a quote in the book or something that they talk about in the soft community and the special operations forces community. I feel like I'm part of it now. I mean, uh, you know, I wasn't a Delta sniper or anything, but I read a book about it, the talent war. So I, I, I don't think that's anywhere close, but sure. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, they, in the soft community, they call it the disease of victory. And I'm going to have George expound upon that a little bit, but it's a really cool Theory, I don't know that it's even theory, but a uh, principle that they talk about. Or I feel like we're guilty of it here. I feel like we're we're guilt. I'm guilty of it in so many ways. It's just a comparison thing. It's just letting letting your ego get out of control. Well, I'm doing it better than this guy, so I'm cool. No no re- no reason to get better. We're fine, right? That is, that is a, it's a scary place to be because you don't realize you're there. Somebody has to like slap you out of it. Yeah, Brent Buckley slapped a lot of people out of it around here when we when we did his podcast and found out he was popping seven million dollars a year in equipment sales on eighty uh, over eighty percent maintenance calls because a lot of people felt like they were top dog it, all over the country in our audience until they heard that episode and they're like, "Whoa, I thought I was you know sitting on top of the mountain. Turns out I'm I'm on a hill next to the mountain, and it's one of those things where like." your victory might be pretty local. You should look outside your local territory to find out what bigger victories look like. Not in a comparison and make yourself feel like crap way, but like a motivational thing. No, but it goes back to that old analogy about being a big fish in a little pond or a little fish in a big pond. Brian, do you, do you know if it's true that, uh, I mean, I've heard this, but I think it is the case with goldfish. They'll grow as big as the, uh, the place they're in. I think that's a pretty common thing with fish. Not all fish, but like they'll grow to the size of their yeah. bowl. They'll grow to the size it, of their lake. I believe it's a goldfish thing. Yeah. So, I mean, that that's a perfect example there where like you become as big as you're willing to allow your world to become. And if you get in the mindset, not that goldfish really have strong mindsets. I mean, they have like a three second memory or whatever. But if you get in that mindset that like, oh, I'm now king of this jar and you never plop yourself into another bigger jar, another bigger lake, another bigger pond, whatever you want to use, then you you just stay that size and you are restricted by the invisible walls of that glass jar that you have self-imposed upon you. And that is a, not just a dangerous, but a deadly place to be because you've restricted your growth. And in turn, you've restricted your potential outcome, your potential, uh, you know, the, the thing that you could become because that you have chosen the smaller, um, the smaller area where you can be easily more dominant, but far less productive. That's where things really get scary. And if you start talking about that in terms of business, you know, Hey, maybe you are dominating your market. Maybe you are the beast in your area. Are you done? Is that enough? I mean, turn that even on on to an individual side. I mean, maybe you're really amazing at uh, one certain attribute of your job. Is that it? Is that all you have? Is there nothing else in you? 
Have you restricted yourself down into a place where you can be king easily uh, because you haven't stepped up into a bigger world with bigger fish? Yeah, and it's nice to relate this to the to the you know field technicians as well. Although, as I read as I read the talent war, and this seems like a straight up recruiting podcast. Like this is only for the owners and managers. That's not necessarily the case, as uh, my as uh, my old mentor Lance could tell you, and probably Ken Goodrich as well. When I worked for Yes Plumbing, Heating and Air, I filled the plumbing division with my people. It was my brother, my brother-in-law, my cousin, John, at one point, um, a guy, Matt, a kid that I met at at Ferguson who was working with a, he was a union apprentice and he told a hilarious story behind, uh, in front of the counter that had the whole place, like just waiting for him to get to the end. And everybody loved the way he, he communicated and, he went outside to smoke a cigarette and I just ran out after him and recruited him to come in my passenger seat and <laughs> work for us. But it was, it was people that I met anywhere and everywhere. If I'm like, no, oh, this dude's a fit. This guy would be great on our team. I'd like to work with them. I would recruit him. I became a recruiter and I got paid handsomely for that stuff. You know, you uh, most companies I'm sure have some kind of uh, referral bonus whereby you, you as a service tech, anyone, CSR, installer, anyone who knows other people in the trades can get paid to bring them over. It, it, it's a benefit to you to become a recruiter. So this podcast, this episode, this book can be great for, for anyone, but it also isn't just recruiting. I mean, there are so many really cool leadership, um, self-discipline, just quality principles in this book that that make me want to be a better everything reading it I just want to be a better version of me reading it especially when they're talking about the drive component and they're they're going back they're going over the um what it means to be driven and they use all these these uh examples of navy seals and rangers and delta guys and stuff like that and they'll talk about that you know there was one guy who was just so competitive and so driven and always just busting through plateaus and goals and and they asked him man who are you competing against and his answer was nobody i'm just trying to get better (laughs) so he's competing against himself this morning right that's how i see it compete against brian yesterday now, if Nate starts passing me in any way, obviously I'm going to step on the gas big time, but that's never going to happen. So we don't worry about that. <laughs> that's, that's fair. All right. That's fine. Uh, yeah, Brian, I'm looking forward to talking to George. His book I know has been um, a, uh, a highlight in your vast reading career, uh, listening career. Yep. And uh, we're yep, excited to, to actually, we, uh, we brought that in. In fact, Brian said bring that book in to give to our recruiting team. So they're reading they're starting to read it through it right now. Yeah, we we actually mandated that our um, well, we have a recruiter and an HR director here, that our recruiter read this book because it gave me, uh, who has less and less to do with the actual recruiting every day now. It seems like since we have a full time recruiter, but it, it gave me a renewed sense of ownership over that recruiting piece. And recruiting has always been a strong suit for me because, like I said, in in the company I was at, the first company I feel like I was ever at where I was so proud to be there that I had to make everybody else join me. You know, it's like, it's like the new, um, you know, you just got into cryptocurrencies and you won a little bit of money. I'll say win because it is kind of gambling, but you just, you know, your investment doubled or tripled and you got to tell everybody about it or you just got on a new diet, you know, your paleo or whatever. And you just got to tell all your friends or whatever it is. It's like when you get into something new, uh, some people are more apt than others to share and, and want to bring other people in. And that's me in most aspects, but certainly when I got to that company, I wanted to bring people in. And if you feel like that about where you work, the team you work with, and this book is for you, learn how to recruit, learn how to get top talent. And if it's not, if you're not at that type of place, bring people in anyway. 
Like change, change the culture of it. Put more space between you and whatever manager you don't like. Just bring people in. Right now, we're going to bring our guest to the show, George Randall, and we're going to put him in your passenger seat. Our guest today is George Randall. He is an experienced talent executive, veteran, coach, and leader known for selecting, building, and reorganizing teams to reach their full business potential. George has 20 plus years of Fortune 100 and Fortune 1000 global human resources and talent acquisition experience, building and coaching elite teams. George began his professional life by enlisting in the U.S. Army Reserves. While serving in the USAR, he received his bachelor's degree from Missouri State University and was commissioned an officer. His career assignments included Berlin, U.S. CENTCOM, and three corps with deployments to Africa, Somalia, Kenya, Central America, Guantanamo Bay, and Cuba. Following his successful military career, George transitioned to the corporate world, experiencing many of the same challenges veterans face today. These challenges, along with the recognition that building elite teams are his true passion, George ultimately transitioned to human resources and talent acquisition functions, serving the last 10 plus years as a global HR executive and leader. Over the course of his time as an executive, the teams George has built have led and hired over 85,000 professionals, including 2,000 executives. He is also known for his decades of work supporting veterans and their transitions, ultimately creating one of the largest and most successful veteran hiring programs for Global Fortune 50 firm. He is joining us today as the co-author of the best-selling book, The Talent War, How Special Organizations and Great Organizations Win on Talent, and he's also the co-host of the Talent War podcast. With that, welcome to the show, George. Hey, thanks, guys. Appreciate you uh, having me on. Yeah, we appreciate you coming on. It's it's one of these things where, as our audience knows, um, a lot of times the way I come across guests for the podcast is I look through my Audible recommended book list, and if something catches my eye, a lot of times just a book cover. And this was one of those. I, it caught my eye because... It had the seal on it, which, which I, you know, I'm not a military guy, but I appreciate, and that thing always catches the eye. And then it said, mm-hmm. uh, forward by Jocko Willing. So I'm like, all right, hold on, let me check this thing out. Did the sample cut, you know, <laughs> checked the, checked the sample out, liked what I heard, downloaded the book. And, um, man, I, I really considered us and myself to be high level, um, recruiters. Like we have, we have ways of getting people in here that are not normal to our, to our market or or the trades and not just like finding good, good qualified people and bringing them in. But like you guys really harped on, uh, what was it? Train for attitude or I'm sorry, higher attitude and train skill. Yeah. Yeah. Higher character, train skills. And, um, you know, calling in from Texas. I mean, one of the examples we used in the book was, Everybody knows Southwest Airlines. You know, Herb Kelleher, when he founded Southwest Airlines, he just said, look, I'm hiring great attitudes. He goes, the rest of the stuff I could teach. And, and look at what they've become. So they were kind of a shining example. Um, you know, and the other thing is, is for our book, and, and, and thank you for that. I, I really appreciate, you know, that you found it that way. It, it's good to hear, and I'm, I'm so glad you liked the book. The interesting thing is one of the premises of the book was you know, if you go around and, and I'm ex-military, I'm ex-Army and, you know, Mike Sorelli, ex-Navy, ex-Navy SEAL. And, and I think what most people see in the book, they're like, hey, an Army and a Navy guy wrote a book that wasn't in crayon on a big red tablet. And, they're, they're really, they're, <laughs> and it wasn't you know, they're really proud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, they, you know, so we're kind of proud of that. Not that some crayons work neat in the process. Um, <laughs> but, you know. What's interesting is there was this great point we were making. We were talking to a group of people, and that is if, you know, special operations and military recruiters, they'll go out to high schools and college campuses, you know, and if you could imagine just for a second, if you go out there and say, okay, who has halo skills, high altitude, low opening, parachute, hey ho, high altitude, high opening, uh, who has You didn't mean the Xbox diver? game? Because uh, quite a few hands. Yeah, were both of us raised our hands like, oh, dude, I'll smoke you in halo, George. You don't want it with this. <laughs> yeah, I forgot. I got to remember my age here. Um, but who has sniper skills? You know, nobody would raise their hand. So by default, 
And the reason we use special operations is not just because we're built military background, but they're a great example that they had to become experts in potential based hiring. They can teach the rest of it, but it was the character attributes. It was the things that made up that person. You know, you know, could you imagine putting some of the, the best weaponry ever invented on the planet, the most lethal machines in the hands of people that didn't have the right character? Anybody can go out and get a lot of this equipment right now, the night vision goggles and stuff like that. You can't operate, you know, military drones, but it's the character of the person that matters. And so that was kind of the, you know, if you will, the case study. And then we paired it up with good companies to, to make the point of higher attitudes, higher character, train skills. I love that, George. And that's certainly a concept that we echo here. Uh, but before we jump too far into the content, why don't you tell us a little bit about your character and skills? How did you get into this whole thing and, and what made you write the book? Oh, wow. So, um, you know, I grew up, my dad drove a truck for UPS. My mom was a social worker, which generally meant that I was going to pay my way through school. Uh, so I enlisted in the Army and uh, worked my way up in reserves to sergeant. Got the leadership bug, became an officer, and as Mike Sorelli, my co-author, likes to remind me, he's a global war on terror guy. I'm a Cold War guy. Um, <laughs> I ended up in Berlin in 89, so I you know, was working Checkpoint Charlie and near the Berlin Wall and the Berlin fence line. Um, but did eight years as an officer, a lot of time in command, and then just thought, hey, um, I'm looking at being a PowerPoint ranger for the next seven to 10 years. That didn't excite me. It was the leadership. So I jumped into corporate America through the veterans firms. Um, it didn't match up so well. Um, and so I was, I happened to join this really great consulting firm kind of called KPMG Consulting. To fast forward as much as I can, had a family circumstance, had to relocate, and they said, hey, you know, can you do recruiting and human resources? And, you know, I wanted to get back to Texas from D.C., and so I said yes. And my career launched from there. I found a home in, in recruiting, and so I've been in recruiting for 23, 24 years. I've led some of the largest organizations. My teams have hired over 80,000 people to include 2,000 executives in over 90 countries. And then I was listening to the Jocko podcast, and, and I heard about this guy, Mike Sorelli, here in Austin while I was the vice president of the cybersecurity company doing global town acquisition. And I started advising this company, and you know, we quickly became brothers, quickly became friends, and you know, he was trying to place special operations veterans and I had built a lot of veterans programs and started advising him. And it just kind of clicked in this one day. You know, we should write a book about this between all the things that we know about talent and you know about the system. You know, let's put this together. Now, I joked that the idea came to him while his wife was making him watch Real Housewives of Beverly Hills and his <laughs> mind was running. He will not openly admit to that as a, as a former special operator. But uh, And so we wrote the book, and then the book kind of turned into a company, and we've been off and running since. And this, is, this is what I was or started to say, at least in the beginning, was we, we consider ourselves pretty uh, innovative, I guess I'd say, in terms of recruiting. We're always trying to think outside the box. But when I read the book and, and saw how in every single chapter, I saw another example of someone thinking much further outside the box. I'm like, this was a huge, this was a huge book for me. It's got me. I actually uh, mandated that our recruiter read this book and I'm, I'm really hyping it in our, in our, uh, we're, wow. in, we're in a well, lot. Thank of, you for that. Yeah. Well, thank you for the book. We're in a lot of, um, group like Facebook groups and stuff with other owners, managers and higher level thinking, um, tra trades people. And it's been something I've been pounding on. Everybody loves Jocko obviously. So I'm like, Hey, check this book out. Jocko did the forward, you know, catch, catch him the same way that I got caught. <laughs> and he reads his own forward in the intro, which was, which I thought was really cool. So, um, yeah, I, we definitely want to dive into some, while we have you, some of those, ideas, some of those principles you guys talk about. Um, and for me, what set that book apart from, you know, you always, I always try to read up on talent acquisition and innovative thinking in terms of getting new people into the trades. But one, one thing we did in particular in the service Einstein's chat, which is um, just one of these think tank groups for owners uh -huh. and managers of HVAC plumbing and electrical companies 
I put a poll in there to see what was the most difficult position to hire for. And that poll, I think by about last I looked by about 25% over any other position was the lead HVAC installer. So what that means is it's pretty tough to hire character and train skill when you're in the heat of summer. Right. Mm -hmm. And you need maybe, I mean, like us currently, we could use two more drop in lead HVAC installers. So can you talk from the book's perspective or your experience perspective on needing this one piece of really technical person who's already trained up and ready to go as opposed to hiring a high character person, which is obviously what we want ultimately. But how do we recruit for that and, and still maintain that character um, principle when you're in the heat of summer and like things are, things are moving a hundred miles an hour? Oh yeah. And down here in Texas, you know, um, I run into the HVAC folks. I know them on a first name basis and write Christmas cards and, and leave food whenever I can. Or, <laughs> <That you do. laughs> or, 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 or if they come to my house, you know, there, there's, there's a good imported or micro brew on the table with their name on it, I assure you. So <laughs> absolutely invaluable uh, here in Texas. You know, I think if you'll just kind of allow me to back up a little bit, one of the big challenges that I found with companies and all throughout my career is we're only hiring when we have an opening. So one of the first pieces of advice is, you know, those those lead, those senior roles become more and more difficult and more and more urgent, you know, once somebody's already departed. And so what I've tried to, to tell people, to the ability that you can, you have to be a talent scout at all times. You always have to assume that you're going to have turnover, that you're going to have promotions or somebody's going to have some kind of retirement or medical event. And you're going to need, you know, the people that you need. So you need to be hiring, you know, at the lowest level and building those skills along the way so that you better said, you know, in the military, if one of our top leaders is taken out, there's always somebody to step up. Right. So you the have to mentality. the best. Yeah, the next man, the next man, next woman up mentality, certainly co-ed, my brothers and sisters in arms. Um, and we work with Lisa Jaster here, who, you know, first mom at age 37 to go through ranger school. An awesome, awesome leader. Wow. Um, but, you know, I tell people, and, and I will get to that question, you really got to start bringing in and training as many people at the lower levels and bringing them up, building a legacy of leadership and craftsmanship, you know, and training for everybody so that you can operate under the next person up concept. The other thing I tell people is I, it's, it's so hard and I get it even in my profession to need that senior person with all of those skills. But, don't when you let that fear of not having it, that pressure of not having it, if you compromise on the character and on the traits and you go for the skills, you have created another problem that will manifest itself within three to six months. And if they don't have the character, especially in the services based industry, you can hire somebody with the skills, but they're, you know, not good with the clients. They're not good with client service. Hey, you fixed that problem. You got paid for it, but you've got no repeat business. You've got no continuing funnel of revenue. And so as much as you need, what I tell people in those senior positions is look through on a skills basis. Is it really absolutely required that they have three to five years of this or five to seven years of this or 10 years of this? Or is it somebody that has the learnability the emotional intelligence, the curiosity, the drive, the resiliency, those character attributes that maybe they've only been doing this for a year or so. But you know what? With a little bit of supervision, some coaching, some course correction, they can step up and grow into that role because the character and the client service is what's going to matter. And you can get those skills further and further refined day by day by day. So many people, and it and it isn't just limited to, you know, I had this in cybersecurity. We need 15 years of dealing with, you know, X programming. And I'm like, well, what does 15 years prove to you? 
you know, where I found somebody with nine years that has the mental aptitude, the skills, the care, has the basic skills and the character that I can train up into that position. But, you know, I totally respect people's fear when you're missing that role that you want to, you want to get all the skills you can and compromise on the character, but you're only creating a problem down the road for yourself. So George, in, in that mindset, I mean, you're kind of uh, taking some of the emphasis off of the hiring portion and moving it into the training realm. So what if, uh, you know, what if I'm saying like, well, I'm not, I'm not set up to provide on the job training, you know, to get somebody from that nine year mark to that 15 year mark quickly. Uh, what would be your suggestions or, or help in terms of getting that training piece developed in the business? Well, that's a hard one, not being from that industry. And I, I get that people don't have time, but you have to make the time. You know, it, it doesn't matter the industry that you're in. You always have to be training, coaching, and mentoring. You have to find that time. You have to find that balance. Because finding that time, putting in that training, upskilling people, mentoring people, coaching people, giving those people experiment, you know, experience is going to pay off when you really, truly don't have the time. When you're here in Texas in the heat of the summer and you're 24 hours on call, of course you're going to have limited time to train and stuff like that. But as much as people say they don't have time, I, I double down on that and really challenge them to, you know, can you spend 30 minutes a day? Can you spend 45 extra minutes? Can you do a working lunch, you know, where you're eating and training at the same time? Can you fit that in? Because putting it off now, it, it's Murphy's Law. Right. If you don't do it now when you don't make the time, when is that problem going to surface? And it's going to surface at the worst possible time, and you're going to get a bunch of knock-on problems from it. So, George, I'm curious. I mean, I'm sure you're doing consulting work across the nation and maybe even beyond yep. that. But as you do that, you know, have you been able to identify – several characteristics that you have found to be like the common denominator of a good hire, no matter industry, no matter, uh, you know, technical ability or background or those things. Like, have you identified some characteristics that you have found to be the ones to, to hone in on when hiring? Well, the first one for me is integrity. And it's, and you know, it's interesting. We put that as one of our nine foundational attributes. But it's the one question that regardless of industry, regardless of company, people don't ask questions about people's integrity. Will they tell the truth under the most difficult circumstances? And if they will, then they are more likely than not to do what they say they're going to do. And if they can't get it done, they are going to work with you to get it done because their word is everything to them. So integrity is always one of those people, that, one of those traits that I look for that I would tell you 98% of the people out in the world just take for granted at this time of day. So how, I mean, how do you um, test that out? Because I can ask somebody in an interview like, Hey, you know, rank yourself from zero to 10 on integrity or when's the last time you told a lie? I mean, can't they just, you know, BS me right there in the interview? Oh yeah, they can. Um, but what, what I do is I make sure that they, you know, I do a behavioral question. So I will ask them, and this is really fun to do with executives. If you could sit on my side of the table when I interview executives, but I asked them, I said, listen, I want you to share with me the last time that you had to deliver the truth. That was very bad information, be it for the client, the product, missing a deadline, your, your revenue numbers, your missed numbers, where you had to tell the hard truth, even when you knew it would mean negative consequences to your career, to your evaluation, or to the perception of your team. Walk me through every bit of it. And I will get beads of sweat out of executives. Um, but I make them tell me the story of when they had to deliver some bad news. And if it's not bad enough news, then I'll know they're tap dancing and I'll go back at it again. Yeah. But I want somebody to give me a real life example of what went wrong, why it went wrong, how you took ownership of it, how you accepted responsibility, and we're going to stand in the face no matter what with integrity and tell the truth so that the person you were working with could use that actionable information to then move forward and correct whatever issue faced them. Awesome. Well, what are some of those other uh, nine characteristics that you really honed in on? Yeah, for me, I think the second's probably drive. 
It's just somebody that has the energy, the appetite, and the natural inclination for a bias for action. And what happened yesterday is what happened yesterday. I'm not resting on it. I'm going to go accomplish something else today. I'm going to do something more today, even if that's 1% more than I did yesterday or half a percent. Uh, the next thing behind that is probably resiliency. And, and resiliency, I don't think we test enough for it because it's really industry agnostic. There's always a coworker um, who's going to create a problem for us, doesn't do what they say. There's always a customer that's going to tell us they have a problem that they caused and blame it on us. There's always going to be a product malfunction. There's going to be something that's going to be a setback or an obstacle to accomplishing your mission of service, delivery of product or sale or something. And I want people who will take those setbacks or those obstacles and go, okay, no factor, to use Jocko's term, that's what's in front of me. I'm going to find a way to deliver and accomplish the mission no matter what. So I want drive resilience. I want integrity. The other thing that I really look for, for me, because it speaks to how they're going to work on the job site, but it also, and I think it probably would relate really well uh, to the group of listeners, and that's what we call effective intelligence. And the best way to just, I've described that to people that I speak with is everybody's been in an organization where there's just a go-to person. It's not that they know the most. It's just you know they're going to get stuff done. And so effective intelligence is defined as being able to take possibly disassociated pieces of data or information or scenarios and put them together to provide a solution where no previous book solution existed. Those people who can go, okay, they can just start thinking through, noodling through something and go, okay, well, let's try this and let's work on this. But their intelligence is their whole world brought together to figure out a solution to a problem where this problem had never existed or there was never a solution to this problem previously. So those are the things I'd say. If I get those things right with a candidate, generally everything else falls into place. We have some others in there, you know, certainly team ability. It's hard to rank order these because team ability is important. Curiosity is important. Uh, emotional intelligence is important. But for me personally, if I get the integrity, if I get the effective intelligence, the drive and resiliency, and sometimes team ability, I've got enough that I know that I can build a lot with that person. Yeah, I, I especially like that uh, one that you were just talking about there and kind of the abstract thinking piece. And in the trades, we have quite a bit of that requirement because we, we have situations where they have to literally troubleshoot just on what they're finding. They have to discover uh, you know, the problem, what's causing the problem. It could be behind walls. It could be in, in the product itself. It could be coming from some other outside source and they have to figure out the solution. So there's a, a huge need for the ability to not only discern what is going wrong, but also create and craft the solution specific to that problem at the time while under the pressure of perhaps, you know, water leaking on the floor or sparks flying or the homeowner is standing over the back of you sweating because they don't have AC. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what's interesting is you combine that with emotional intelligence, too. And then you know they're going to take care of the clients, but work with the clients and say, hey, listen, this is something new here. Let me walk you through what I'm doing, what I'm thinking, and how we're going to resolve this. You get client service, and you get dynamic, creative thinking and problem solving all at the same time. Okay. Um, and and now I can't imagine because, you know, I – you know, I sat through the, the deep freeze here in Texas. And so, you know, I, I have, you know, plumbers, I have HVAC issues in the summer, you know, every once in a while. And I love, see, you know, I can see immediately their mind. It's like short of smoke coming out their ears. I can actually see how they're problem solving and <laughs> running through everything Right. And I get fascinated watching them do that, that craftsmanship, that ability, because I have zero mechanical ability. I make my living talking. And it's fascinating for me as a talent expert or somebody well versed in talent, probably a better way to say it, more humble way to say it, to see that go on. Because then I'm like, OK, so you said this was going to take an hour. Now it's taking two and a half hours. Hey, I'm good with that. I know you're trying to solve my problem, which is everything to me as a homeowner. Absolutely. And that, you know, the, 
the the stuff that you know we do when we show up that's kind of a given to the homeowner and yet there's there's so much value to that i mean when they call somebody up to come out and fix their problem that's what they want they want their problem fixed they don't care how it gets done or you know any of that stuff it's it's is it going to get fixed and there's there's such a value to that and unfortunately in the trades i think that's one of the most undervalued thing uh, from a homeowner's perspective, is just the sheer ability and knowledge of how to do something that you can't do. Oh yeah, and I, you know, I will when those when I have those those people come to my house and they do a great job, they are in every contact file I ever have, and I refer them out to every single person I know. I, I have a list of those kind of people who are great at customer service and great at problem solving. Because if they come back and, and I know they also have integrity as business owners and they, they take pride in, in solving problems and delivering great service and solving my problems. If that person says, you know what, this is really complicated. You're going to be without air conditioning for two or three days. I have that trust built up with that person that I'm like, you know what, if they could get me, you know, cool air today in Texas when it's 100 degrees, I know they would. But you know what? I'm going to wait the three days because this is the person I want doing it because the solution I get, I know it's going to last me and be more reliable and I'm going to get great value out of what I'm paying for. So that effective intelligence, that emotional intelligence and client service is uh, when I find it, I never want to lose it. Absolutely. And and to counter that a little bit, at least uh, in terms of the individual Mm -hmm. level, which is, pretty much what the homeowner is going to be dealing with anyway. They're rarely, rarely dealing with a company, usually dealing with one person on the phone and then one person at their home. In the book, you talked about selection errors, which is a very, very polite way of putting hiring mistakes yeah. <laughs> where yeah. the wrong person was selected. In, in the book, it says whenever a selection error occurs, the soft community or special operations forces the soft community takes a hard look at how the member got through and what mistakes mm-hmm. were made. Without an effective feedback loop, there is no way to assess the success of, of the hiring strategies. Can you talk a little exactly. bit about, one, what, what makes a, a hiring mistake or a selection error, and two, maybe a little bit about that feedback loop, which is something that we really don't do a lot of, uh, I feel like, in the trades, like we have feelings about who's right and wrong. Um, and, and a lot of us may have very good processes in terms of who to bring on, but we have no sort of feedback loop on the back end when somebody didn't fit our mold, despite the fact we thought they did. Yeah. I, and <clears throat> so I'll start out by saying this. Um, there aren't a lot of people on the planet whose teams have hired more people than I have. Um, I, I, I remember one time I was given a project, very short notice, but I put 3,000 people into one location within 90 days. Oh, my word. So I can share, and that was in Manila, and highly technical roles. So I can tell people confidently that I've hired more than most on the planet. And the one time that I think I can see talent and I go to those, oh, yeah, they went to the same school as me. Oh, I've seen this before. Oh, you know what? They have this experience. They work for this company. And I start going down that laundry list of common kind of nepotistic related mistakes and using my years of experience as my divining rod for talent. That's when Murphy's Law comes and bites even me in the process. And it does every time. So to your point about hiring mistakes, You know, you have to have a process that, first of all, you have to define success. Like, what are the things that we're looking for above and beyond the skill set? What character attributes do we need? Do we deliver to our customers, to our clients? Understand what success looks like. Then put that job description together and have a system and a set of questions that helps you determine to what degree they do or do not have that attribute that determines success. And make sure that you take out, oh, you know, they went to this trade school or, you know, so-and-so knows them and refer them over. I got to tell you, referrals are usually the people that we make the mistakes on the most. And the reason that happens is, oh, I know so-and-so. If they worked well for so-and-so, they'll work just fine. They'll kill it in our environment. 
it actually, with executives, it is the most insidious. It's the dark side of employee referral. You have to put even known quantities through a process. However short that process is, however long it is, put them through it and make sure that you've done your evaluation for your company, your team, your environment on that candidate. Make sure that you do not say, oh, you know, oh, they like, you know, they're in a Corvette club or, you know, they're a Chicago Bears fan or, you know, and get talking about, you know, the glory days of the Bears, you know, or the glory days of the Bulls as an example. <laughs> Ditka? That you're like the, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, you like Mike Ditka. Yeah. And, and I always bring that up because my dad's a Bears and a Cubs fan and a Bulls fan, Blackhawks. And by the way, I'm a Patrick Mahomes, Kansas City Chief lifelong fan for, for those who want to know. But <laughs> those little tiny things where, because the human condition is we want to connect with somebody and we want to have something in common. And when we find something in common, we're over-reliant and we start turning that into likability which is where people make those hiring errors. Oh yeah, yeah, this person, you know, even the Navy SEALs, they're like, hey, you know, this person came out of, you know, our special boat units or, or whatever, SWIC. Yeah, they're gonna make it through, no problem, they're gonna be a great SEAL. They don't do that, they put them through the process every time. You've gotta pull all the biases, known and unknown, out of the process. And then to the feedback thing, when you have a bad hire, the first thing you have to do is check your ego, okay, Assume if they're working for me, what mistake did I make? What did I miss? What did I not ask? It's as simple as that. Hey, was the job posting we put out there, did it, did it really say, hey, you know, we, did it put very clearly what we were looking for? And did we evaluate that? And if not, how do we get it better? And so that feedback loop, it, it's never going to make your hiring perfect. You're always going to get people that slip through. I'm going to make a mistake. But that process, that feedback loop, you know, helps you get better and better and better. And it's just a matter of higher accuracy because the more and better hires that you get, then when you put leadership and invest into them, you know, then you're off and running and you're not hiring as much. You have greater retention and you have greater results. I love the, the concept of, or at least the way I pictured it in my head when, when uh, I was reading about the the soft community has morphed into a world-class study in talent acquisition and talent management. And the way you guys were going through that, I was picturing it almost like a funnel um, where you were, you know, the, the process it of is. hiring and retaining yeah. was and training was going down a funnel and all the stuff that didn't belong was kind of rising up to the top and not making it down the tube. And, and it's like, and how many years has this been happening and it's still going through that exact same process. And not many companies have that kind of longevity and have been, you know, as, as strictly focused on that as the soft community is. And it, it, it really made me feel dwarfed in what we do, um, but also inspired to go, this is what we should be, do, we do, be doing. I mean, we should probably have a book, like a, you know, a book that we, we go to and anytime we realize we made a hiring mistake, we, we write up in that book, where did we go wrong? Why wasn't this person a fit? How can we change our hiring plan for the next person? And it's funny because again, when we get into the heat of summer, I'm guessing something like when, you know, if we, if uh, the president declares war or something, all of a sudden you guys need HVAC installers quick, right? It's the heat of summer. And, and uh, there's that urge to really start just filling the pipeline with uh, mm -hmm. either high GPAs or, high-end college athletes or whatever you would see on a resume that would make somebody a valuable uh, asset for the soft community. Although I heard all the reasons why none of that works every time, but that's how we get in the summer, in the summer months, you know, we just need somebody who can just throw this equipment in and do a, do a great job. And if we're, if we're going back to the book, like you guys do and, and putting those notes in, like this didn't work and here's why this did work. And here's why. Now we can that that part. You, I wanted to. I'm sorry to interrupt, but that part too. That you know, people are making movies of when special operations gets it right, <clears throat> and so they you know they certainly get to see the upside. Documentaries uh, when good, it goes wrong, huh? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you know what companies don't do is 
you know, one of the things that I instituted in my last company is we had the feedback loop on when somebody didn't make three months, six months, a year, or whatever. We were, you know, managing up attrition, marrying up attrition data with our selection process. But the other thing we also wanted to do the reverse is there's a lot of people out there who are choosing well and asking good questions. When you got it right, what's working? Lock that down. Don't deviate from it. Because so many companies, their hiring process from one person to the next becomes, you know, two different events, two different experiences. And so when you do something right, recognize it, write it down, lock it down, and repeat it until you find out that it doesn't work. Alternatively, those things that aren't working, you know, note it, fix it, put something else in place, and test it and see if it's going to work. Um, but those people that are good at hiring, too, have them interview the next person as well. Hey, this guy, he's, he's got a great batting average. He's asking good questions. He's making good selections. These people are, you know, staying with the company. They're delivering excellent, you know, uh, solutions and, you know, solving our clients and our customers' problems quickly and, you know, with integrity and the reputation that we want. All right, let's have, you know, this A player continue to find other A players, which is something else we've talked about. And something else we read about in that book we uh, we might have gotten to the point where we just felt like we were the the juggernaut in our area in terms of, of hiring talent, and we were, you know, we're so good at what we do. Whenever we need to fill a position, we just go to market and get that person and, and done deal. That we weren't doing a lot of this stuff, especially the feedback loop. That that's something that was not happening. But um, I wanted to talk about this concept because I'm not sure outside of maybe uh, what was it, the Dark Knight Rises. Uh, I've heard this concept before, but Bane actually said it to Batman once. Nate will remember. I know he's a big fan. Um, which was the disease of victory. Would you mind yeah. going going into what that concept is a little bit, and then I'll maybe I'll explain why I think that we were suffering from that in our hiring, among <clears throat> other things. Yeah, well, it's all rooted in bad ego. Um, we get overconfident, and and you know we talked about that. It really comes out of the military. You know, the disease of victory is complacency. Hey, we're good enough. We're the best. We can continue on with the status quo. And anytime that happens in the military, you know, the results are catastrophic. And it comes when your ego's gotten in the way. You think you're good enough. You've reached the pinnacle. You're doing everything right. And you're not constantly trying to improve. Even when you win, you know, there's a thing that when I do executive coaching and I talk to some of the CEOs that I work with, is I say, you know, the better you get, the better you better get. So if you think you're great now, what got you there isn't getting you to the next step. And if you think you can declare victory where you are, the disease that comes from that is complacency. And when you're complacent, your competitors, your enemy, they will take over your revenue stream. They will figure out what you did right. They will do it better. They'll take your clients. They'll take your customers. And now you've fallen, you know, 10 years behind where you were, all because your ego said, hey, I've arrived. Is really what it comes down to. So good and so true. Uh, I, I enjoy the analogy there of our enemies taking over. <laughs> a little, little strong words for the corporate world, but hey, who, you know, maybe. <laughs> maybe when you start talking more like that in the conference room, buddy. <laughs> well, George, I know you're on a timeline here, and uh, chapter nine of your book is really where you spend a bulk of the amount of time talking about a decisive battlefield. Let's jump into that and, and talk about what you mean uh, by that term. Well, there's a lot of different quotes that we would pull. Hiring is the decisive battlefield because the basic, there were a lot of like key premises to the book. I didn't want to say that there was one. Um, but one of the things that Mike and I have said continuously and we talk to when we're speaking or the clients that we're coaching or consulting with is that the one true competitive advantage you can hope to achieve and maintain is your people. There are countless examples. You know, we use the example of Blockbuster being overtaken by Netflix. You know, taxis, everybody, a, a taxi was just a thing that we all grew up with and then Uber out of nowhere and Lyft. And it's the people behind driving the ideas, driving you forward. So the decisive battlefield essentially becomes the better that you can attract, assess, select, hire, retain, 
train and grow your people. Ultimately, it amounts to the fact that you have the best people on your team and the team with the best people wins and wins constantly. Providing you don't get that, you know, the complacency disease. So the decisive battlefield is the people that can attract better market and, and give people what they want that they can assess those people. Do they have the attributes necessary to be successful on our team, in our environment, with our clients? And then get those people on board, teach, coach, mentor, train those people. Then you're going to have ultimately have a company that survives and thrives and weathers the storm because you have driven, resilient, curious, you know, team players that are going to solve problems that you've invested in, that care about your mission, that care about delivering to the clients and care about the success of the company and the team. So the decisive battlefield is how people hire. And, and that's where it all makes a difference because your product, your service, it's all going to change with technology, with time, with market conditions. But hiring and getting talent, talent can change faster than the times. And so if you get that right, that's the spot on the battlefield in the war for talent that will put you ahead of everybody else. It may not do it immediately. You know, we take great pains to say in the book, hey, get this right. You're, it's like investing. It's investing in your own company, in your own future. You, those, Results will keep compounding interest. You will keep getting more and more and more benefits. And exponentially, you're going to do far, far better. And ultimately, even your competitors, we'll use the word instead of enemies, people over there are going to go, hey, these people are getting it right. Man, they they got all the best players. I, I want to go over there. And so it feeds upon itself if you win on that part of the battlefield. Now, going back to what you said there a moment ago, George, you said that uh, that talent – uh, will win over the changing times. Is that correct? Yes. So push that out a little bit because I mean, you know, as, as industries change and mold and technology becomes more involved, I mean, we've all certainly seen people lose their jobs or get pushed out of a job because technology has evolved faster than the person. So how does that ring true with that statement? So for me, it's, it's the people that are making the technology and thinking of new solutions to their current situations that their competitors and other people are thinking about new technology and new products, new services and new ways of delivering that service always come from people. Right. And so people are always going to be the catalyst for that new technology or that new product. So it's, I hate to say it's not chicken and egg, but the technology didn't come before the person. The person that invented the technology came first. Absolutely. And what, what they found in that person was a curious person with a creative mind who saw a problem or saw a void in a particular space that they could create something to solve a problem or deliver something great. You know, and I, I hate to say it. I mean, even in Texas, where we pride ourselves on barbecue and tequila, and, and, oh, by the way, Tito's Vodka is here <laughs> in Austin, Texas. But, you know, there was a genius two miles from my house that the minute that COVID hit was trying to figure out how to deliver margaritas to your door. Yeah. You know, it wasn't technology or wasn't anything, but there was a talented person there going, okay, our restaurant is going to suffer our highest value item our highest profitable item is alcohol. This is a weird example, but it's so true about how a person just sat there and goes, okay, this doesn't mean we have to shut our doors. We have to figure out a new way to deliver and make our clients happy because they love us. They know we're here. They hate we're closed. How do we solve for this? Well, what do people want? Well, it's COVID. They're probably stressed out. Hey, how about a margarita? And it was one of the few restaurants that wasn't affected by COVID. And so it's always the people that are, that are going to be creative or be thinking of something or be ahead of. They're not just in the moment. They're part of the team. They're part of your business and say, hey, you know what? As an example, the HVAC community, you start seeing things repetitively. There are those people that when they go into their next client are going, you know what? I'm going to check on this and tell the client about it. 
because we're starting to see things. I'm going to get ahead of this being their problem, and I'm going to be their solution for that problem. And they become a consultant in their craft. And you've now got a, you now got what Ken Blanchard talks about, a raving fan or a client for life. Right. It's the talent that will always proceed. Yeah, it's so good, and we sure hope it stays that way. If uh, technology ever starts inventing things by itself, uh, we're all in a different world then at that point, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I'm hey, I'm older. I, I don't like kiosks at a restaurant. Of course, I don't visit that many restaurants where we're being kiosks, but I, I don't like that that version of technology. I don't like I'm I'm a person I, I want to drive my own car, and you're right. I hope we don't get to that spot because you know there's too much pleasure and craftsmanship of even driving a car. I think that a lot of people have lost, and it's why when I said earlier, you know, the people that have come and done great services for me, I don't have the brain power, I don't have the mechanical aptitude. Of course, I birthed a son that is a mechanical engineer. He's a genius. I don't know where it came from, but I don't. And and those traits and stuff have become so critical to our way of life. And every time I find somebody that has those character attributes that are delivering a craft that I can't do, it is a whole new level of appreciation for wanting to stay with that company. And, and I've had the same HVAC guy for six houses in 25 years wow. yeah. and I won't, but I won't, I won't budge. I won't budge unless they give me a reason not to, but they always solve my problems always. And I love it. Well, George, this has been excellent content and I'm sure there's more of it. I have one more final question for you, but before we get to that, if people are interested in learning more about you or the talent work group, uh, where's the best place to find you or any information about that? Well, uh, website, talentwargroup.com. Find everything from our podcast, the Talent War podcast, uh, to getting copies of our book. Uh, you can listen to our, our, our podcast and our book, you know, on, on wherever, you know, they sell books and Spotify, Apple, all of that for downloads and stuff like that. Or you can reach out to us, you know, on LinkedIn and connect with myself or my co-author, Mike Sorelli. Awesome. Is there a, you guys do some kind of training program on top of it? Like, um, just, just training like talent acquisition people or something like that. Yeah, we, we do that. So we do a number of things. So executive search, executive coaching, um, Mike himself is truly one of the finest leadership speakers and does leadership workshops that are transformational in a half a day and a full day session for leaders. Um, un, unbelievable stuff. Um, but also Carly, who's uh, our COO and president, um, we come in and we'll both audit and train talent acquisition teams. Because as much as technology has changed talent acquisition, it's still a very human endeavor and a very judgment-based business. And so we, we help teams get really, really good at the basics with people. So they're making better decisions. The technology will help us amplify that. But technology will never substitute for having a great recruiter that takes care of the hiring manager and the candidate at the same time. Right. Excellent stuff today, George. We appreciate your time. And as we bring things in for a landing here, I wanted to focus our last question on Chapter 10, which is entitled, You Can't Hire or Fire Your Way to Success. As we wrap things up today, uh, take us out with kind of your take on hiring and firing your way to success and the inability to do that. It doesn't matter how good your hiring processes are. It doesn't matter if you get rid of your bad apples, your medium to low performers. That's never going to change it. What the great resignation is showing companies in spades right now is that you have to double down on leadership. You may learn or have us come in and help you hire a whole lot faster, but the one thing that you can do is double down on leadership, investing in people. Every place that I've ever been, from the Army to every career I've had, let me put it a different way. People don't lead good companies. They lead bad bosses. Get your leadership as strong as you possibly can to retain the talent that you've worked so hard to bring in the door. And then never, ever rest so you can always operate under the next person up concept. So you can hire great, you can fire great, but you have to invest in your people with great leadership because talent plus leadership equals victory. That's how you win, thrive, and survive in any environment, whether you're special operations or you're a business. 
Excellent advice, George. The book is The Talent War. The author or co-author is George Randall. That's who we've been talking with today. It has been a pleasure to have you on the show today, George. We appreciate not only the insight you shared with this podcast, but of course, uh, everything you did in the book for us as well. So thanks for being with us today. And thank you for your service. Hey. Hey, thank you guys. My honor. Very humble to be on. Good luck. And thank you again. That's a wrap for this podcast. I hope you enjoyed it like we did. Uh, great to be with George and just the insight that he has. He's a gifted speaker. And of course, he uh, outlines that in the book, The Talent War. But it's really cool to be able to break down just a few of the concepts that he shared in the book uh, in terms of, you know, the things that make the difference uh, for hiring, recruiting, and retaining that talent in your business. And one thing I want to focus us back on is the concept of hiring for character, training for skill. That absolutely is a concept that we've tried to embody here and really have been forced to more than anything as, as the trades have experienced um, a significant gap in just people, just regular manpower. Um, we've been kind of forced to look for people who are not skilled and to begin training them up in the ways and of course, the big difference there is finding good people, people that embody your core values, people that embody the team spirit, people that are going to be coachable, that are willing to learn, that have the the raw talent, if you will, uh, to turn themselves into something great. And we've seen it play out time and time again, where we've seen some of our highest producers have come from zero trade background and have made their way into the industry and have really paved paths that have not existed before their their entrance. And that's always exciting to see that happen. I think there's a sort of a terms of re a revolution in the industry with the ability to uh, go from zero to 60 uh, that quickly. And it, it's a good thing. It's what the industry needs to really build up its numbers again, because there's, there continues to be such a gap. And so we're excited for things uh, that come out of this book, like the talent war, and we're excited to continue building the trades. If that's something you're interested in, you know, please reach out to your local tradesperson, find a great company near you and see if they offer uh, apprenticeships or some type of training program. That's of course something that we do here in, in various capacities, but I'm sure many places across the country offer that. And that's really exciting. So if you're looking for a, uh, a career change or you're looking for something different or you're mechanically inclined and you just like to, get in there and fix things. There's so many opportunities for you to learn what you need to do to make not just a living, but a career and, and a life-changing income. And that's the exciting part about the trades. That's a wrap for us here as we close down this episode of the Waste No Day podcast. We hope it's been beneficial to you and we hope that each week we are bringing content that challenges you. Uh, leave us a review and uh, give us five stars. Let us know if you like the podcast, give us some subject or topic, uh, things that would interest you. And of course, we'd love to hear that. And of course, uh, we'll see if we can get some of those guests on. Uh, we leave you now with our challenge, which is every week the same thing, to make the most of what you have in front of you, to choose to wake up each morning and waste no day. <laughs>